It may be draped in sunlight, but this movie more often than not keeps its audience concealed in the dark. What time is it? 9 p.m. That can't be right, the sky is blue. This is what 9 p.m. is like here. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're explaining the ending of Ari Aster's latest film, Midsummer. If you haven't seen this beautiful descent into madness yet, keep in mind that this video will bring you nothing but spoilers and a whole lot of head scratching. That sounds fun. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. As strange as it might sound, one of Astor's major inspirations for this mind-bending folk horror film was the 1981 Albert Brooks comedy Modern Romance. If you really wanted to know anything about me, I'd tell you, but you don't want to know anything anyway, so what the hell difference does it make who I call? Look, it's just sometimes we have difficulty finding a level on which to communicate. Well, we will never find a level on which to communicate. Astor described this unconventional rom-com as, quote, his favorite breakup movie ever. And that is exactly what Midsummer is a movie about a relationship going to hell. Dude, she needs a therapist. You've been wanting out of this stupid relationship for like a year now. We've all been through a bad breakup, but yours probably didn't involve pagan rituals. As the film commences, Christian is on the fringes of breaking up with his girlfriend of almost four years, Danny. When Danny's bipolar sister commits suicide and takes their parents' lives in the process though, Christian decides to stay with her out of obligation. Winter transitions into summer, but a lack of communication continues to put a strain on Christian and Danny's relationship. Danny's mental health is showing no signs of improvement either, as she breaks down at the mere mention of her family. I was so very sorry to hear about what happened. I'm sorry. Much to the chagrin of his friends, Christian invites Danny to accompany them on a trip to a Swedish village where a nine-day festival is held every 90 years. The only member of the group who seems to empathize with Danny is Pele, who is originally from the village and invites Christian's friends as his guests. What starts as a hopeful summer vacation turns sour as something is visibly off about this village and its hippie-esque community. The sun virtually never goes down, disturbing artwork is plastered everywhere, and there's a mysterious yellow fortress nobody is supposed to enter. Even more random, the villagers have a caged bear on standby and they apparently really like Austin Powers. Maybe it's the movie's free love message? Shall we shag now or shall we shag later? It becomes more evident to the audience why Christian and his friends are there when Pele tells them about the village's fertility. That's why you look so guilty right now because you know. Being a small community, the villagers have resorted to incest. While sibling relationships are generally frowned upon, relationships between cousins are approved. One young resident in particular is clearly a production of inbreeding having been horribly deformed since birth. Outsiders have been brought to the village to procreate with the women, introducing new blood into the gene pool. That's not the only purpose Christian and company serve, however. If you thought the village's offbeat nature was a product of the drugs and hallucinogens our characters were taking, things get real when the two camp elders jump off a cliff to grisly results. Seriously, what is it with Aster and heads? As one villager explains, it's tradition for elders to commit suicide at age 72. This naturally doesn't sit well with two visitors named Simon and Connie, who plan to get out of Dodge. When Simon mysteriously disappears, however, a villager informs Connie that he left without telling her. Connie also vanishes without explanation shortly after, indicating that nobody can willingly leave this place. Absolutely not. In spite of the numerous red flags, Christian and Josh decide to stay so they can write their thesis on these disturbed people. As for Mark, well, he's just an idiot who's mainly concerned with getting laid. Mark's foolish behavior culminates with him urinating on a dead tree, which represents the villagers' fallen ancestors. For his ignorance, Mark is escorted away by a beautiful woman during supper which turns out to be his last meal. Dude, of all the things to let me sleep through. The next time we see Mark's face, it's being worn by a villager who kills Josh for sneaking off at night to do some research on the village's sacred texts. This just leaves Danny and Christian, who have only grown further apart since arriving. I don't wanna acclimate, I wanna go. Although Danny has always been skeptical towards the village, the community has also been strangely inviting. On multiple occasions, Pele tells Danny about how he lost his parents at a young age. Pele's grief was never as great as Danny's, however, because he had his village to provide support. 
Kinda sounds like a proposal to join a cult, huh? Is it scary? The persuasive village people succeed in getting Danny to ingest more psychedelics, and she begins to see her body blending in with the surrounding plant life, as if she's becoming one with nature and with the village. Spiraling into insanity, Danny's conversion is brought full circle when she's the last one standing while dancing around a maypole. Danny is thus crowned the May Queen, carried off on a flowery throne, and sits down to a feast where the villagers make her eat a ceremonial herring. Meanwhile, Christian is partaking in a ceremony of his own. As his relationship with Danny continues to deteriorate, Christian grows closer to a flirtatious young villager named Maya. Giving in to temptation, Christian consummates his relationship with Maya, while several other female villagers surround them in the nude. Yep, the guy behind Hereditary definitely made this. <laughs> When Danny catches the cheating Christian through a keyhole, she suffers yet another breakdown. As their queen, the other villagers join in her pain, mimicking her cries. Christian finishes up with Maya, who says she can already feel the life growing inside her. Christian proceeds to rush out of the barn where he finds Josh's leg sticking out of the dirt like a tree and Mark's mutilated body hanging around. Getting knocked out, Christian wakes up unable to move in the middle of another ceremony. Hello, therefore. As part of their festival, the village must sacrifice nine souls. Several people have already been killed, while a couple more villagers offer themselves as tributes. One more person needs to be sacrificed, though, and it's up to the May Queen to decide who will receive this honor. Danny chooses the powerless Christian. Just when you thought this movie couldn't get any more like the Wicker Man, the bear we saw earlier is gutted open and hollowed out. Christian is forced to wear the bear outfit as he's placed in the yellow house we saw earlier, along with the cult members who agreed to give up their lives and several corpses. The dwelling is then set ablaze as Danny watches with her new family. The final shot of the film focuses on Danny's face, which encompasses a conflicted range of emotions. Eventually, a disturbing smile stretches across her face. Danny has not only ended her toxic relationship with Christian, but has also found a way to manage her grief. The hole her sister, mother, and father left behind has been filled by a community that embraces her like royalty. The audience can see that Danny has become a prisoner to this cult and her own insanity. In Danny's warped mind, though, the seasons have changed and so is she. Just as Danny allows the madness to take over, she lets the sunshine in. What am I going through? Of course, there's much more to interpret here in this final scene. Dealing with grief has been a major theme in both of Astor's films. As the only two characters left standing by the film's end, Pele and Danny have had similar experiences when it comes to the death of family members. Could it be that Pele will now become the king to Danny's queen? After all, he was the one who led her to the festival and made her feel more at home. When you think about Pele as this sort of mastermind, the roles that all of the victims play in the final ritual begin to make more sense. Mark as a fool, fit with a jester hat, Christian as a vicious bear, Josh as the genius, represented by the tree imagery, and Danny as his queen. Could this seemingly hopeful ending have otherwise sinister undertones? With Ari Aster, anything is possible. So we're just gonna ignore the bed. It's a bear. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.